Good morning, everyone in Singapore, and hello to our friends joining us from all over the world. Welcome. Thank you for joining us for today's event, Scaling Startups in Asia Pacific. My name is Wei Min from SG Novit. We are a government-owned organization in Singapore who really believes in the power of science and technology, along with the positive impact of deep tech to benefit humanity. A good part of our work also involves investing in startups, building a global community of scientists and bringing their research from lab to market, building deep tech talents, as well as working with our ecosystem partners in scaling deep tech for improving the lives of many around the world. And that is why we have formed this community where our work allow us to engage the deep tech ecosystem through connecting people and knowledge sharing events such as the one we'll be doing today. Today, as a part of promoting knowledge sharing, we are very happy to partner with Huawei to present to you this webinar, where we hope to share a little more on the challenges that AI-focused startups may face as they try to scale their business in the region. And of course, are there ways to overcome these challenges? And is it possible to still thrive in the new normal amidst the current pandemic climate? With that, do allow me to invite Mr. Kubuji, VP APEC AI Ecosystem from Huawei, with a presentation sharing on AI for com business com AI for business continuity to start off the event. BG, please. Thank you, everybody. Uh, let me start uh, sharing my, my screen first. Sorry, a little bit of a hiccup there, okay. Uh, what I would like to uh, share a little bit today, uh, let me start off with something about Huawei first, so, uh, just so that everybody can have a glimpse of uh, what was Huawei is all about. Huawei itself is a global ICT uh, provider. So today we have a uh, uh, staff of over uh, uh, 119,000, uh, which the majority of them is R&D. That actually explains why over the years uh, Huawei have been uh, leapfrogging uh, in terms of a technology and in particular in AI as, as, as what we are speaking of today. Uh, we look at some of the roadmap that we have seen in the past, start up on 2008 and to today, and you see that every other years we actually have a new product and a new innovation in the world. And as per last year, as you can see, that's the year that we are launched our AI capability. And today, today this is already in the, our second year, and we actually have a lot of successes and a lot of experience that we can share to everybody. Uh, one, one good thing about Huawei, as you know, a lot of us are, have not been aware of, is actually Huawei actually have a presence in 170 countries. With that presence, uh, we actually have built up a lot of our part center, our core warehouse. What's this important to you is actually when you develop your AI solution and deploy into the world, one thing that you want to ensure is a continuity. As we talk about business continuity here, we talk about other continuity in terms of a service continuity. Or well, one key element to it is the core fundamental that is a, if anything happened to your part, there is a, a supply or a way to get it changed or get it fixed. So in this case, uh, choosing Huawei could be a very good solution. For, for everybody because that fundamental is a bit assured. Going into AI today, well, we have seen a lot of AI, but one, one of few areas that uh, we would want to actually enhance more on AI is all the key, fa key sectors that we are looking at. Security, we are very familiar with that, finance, transportation, electrical, manufacturing, internet. So these are the things that we are seeing today. However, there are much more. So today's seminar or today's talk, we will also want to uh, trigger everybody to think beyond this field that what can we do with AI today, right? Today, we know that with the capability of AI, we are able to do speech recognition, machine learning, decision, uh, NLP. And in some way, a lot of this actually connected to the IoT device. So IoT itself actually help us to tap on the, in, the critical data and the AI to process it. So looking at Huawei today, what we are providing in terms of AI, I'm glad to share with everybody, we actually provide an end-to-end -end solution. So when you, got, when you embark with Huawei, you actually found that everything is under one roof. So of course, the most important thing in Huawei uh, DNA is being open. So uh, beside all these things that we are shown on the screen, we are also have a compatibility with every other things. But when you look at the screen itself, you'll notice that all the way from the very basic, from the uh, chip itself, 
and to the device and all the way to the, to the people who are AI were very concerned about the flow, the, the, the framework, the tensor flow, the PyTorch, programming language like uh, Python. We all have supported that. So today you have actually an end-to-end -end support itself. And of course, we all have our own programming language. We can call it uh, AC or also CL or also CAN. Uh, CAN is a more, more widely known programming language in Huawei and then, then on top of that, we look at the solution. How are we going to apply your solution to the AI? So a lot of people talk about AI, but actually AI is uh, coming to two area, distinct areas. One is in the uh, edge computing area. That's the one that closest to us and the other one in the data center. So in the past, we see a lot of AI being done. That's something that is hidden from us. Those are the data center solution. Those are the, the mainframe doing processing. Like for example, the bank like to say the KYC. Yeah, those, a lot of them are actually done in the back end. So, but today, Huawei bring AI closer to us in the form of the edge computing. Basically, AI can something that help us as a layman or something like somebody who walk on the street. Let me straight away go into something that immediately you can, can feel the impact of AI, the manufacturing area. Uh, manufacturing in a lot of country is always the bedrock. Like for example, from the country that I come from, Singapore, we start off as a manufacturing country. So manufacturing to us is something that is a call to our heart. So you look at the AI today. So uh, in AI, in this in particular area is for battery inspection. And we also have a lot of a uh, scenario where AI has been used in the uh, area that doing the LCD panel inspection. What actually happened here is that you notice that AI here improved the efficiency. Basically the detection, the error detection has increased and the speed of it has also improved a lot. Okay. Here, AI is, is not to replace a human, but actually to enhance our productivity, allow the humans to do something that they are more competent to that because this particular role of doing visual inspection by human eyes is actually not the right way to correct. So in the past, we don't have a solution, but right now you look at it in manufacturing area, this is what already been implemented and it's something that's doing well. So going forward, AI in manufacturing is something that we're going, we're going to have. And uh, it's not just as uh, looking at some uh, panel, it could be looking at some devices, looking at some model. Like for example, everybody know uh, in cosmetic world, the bottle matters a lot. The bottle of their perfume, like some shape like a shoe, some shape like a body of a human. So how to ensure that the qualities are there, there's no defect because this model will pay a lot of money for it. So in this case area, AI in manufacturing do come in place, right? AI that is an uh, area that we, we taught traditionally is not critical, but in fact, to the people who have been working in manufacturing, in marketing, it's very, it's very important to them. So this way, AI will help. The other area that we are look at is the uh, what what we have been using in ourselves. So this is something that Huawei has been using AI, and I wanted to share you something that is interesting about manufacturing. In this case, we are manufacturing of our servers, the servers component that we look at. Over here, you see the screen here, and we look at the uh, uh, one was the label. So uh, mislabel is actually a very serious thing because uh, components are electronic components that we could ship out to the go all over the world require certain certification. So if you, you slip in a wrong label, that means the certification are wrong. So in this case, certification labeling is very important. The next thing, there's something that is, seems trivial, but it's not trivial if you are, if you are a true uh, a production uh, engineer there, is the number of screw that's on the, uh, the motherboard. So this is something that is very difficult to detect because as as normal human, uh, when they perform or sometimes due to a fatigue, they tend to miss up one or two. So with this AI able to detect it and correct it as time goes. So you look at some of their detection rate, the speed of detection and the accuracy, this is something that is far more better than human. And in fact, it actually improved the productivity as well. Uh, touching on this, the screw itself, there's also one area that we, we see AI is going to become a prevalent. That is in car manufacturing. Car assembly. I won't care about my car assembly. So one area that, to your surprise, that we that uh, AI is going to come in is actually inspection of the final car inspection. The inspection of it. One particular area that I want to draw everybody uh, interest to is actually the number of nuts that on the car wheel. Uh, there has been a proven, uh, based on the study at the uh, inspection sector, that a lot of, there's almost one in the ten car that you have missing nuts in the wheel. So with AI today, this is something that's going to be resolved and you, you will also eliminate 
the chances of a human making error and also spending time walking around the car to look at the wheel nuts. Another area that, uh, that seems trivial to us, but actually it's very important, it's also part of our life, is the gas station. Well, I'm sure a lot of us do drive in the part, a lot of part of the world. And actually you look at gas station, it's actually one of the areas that has been a quite error prone and a lot of incidents that happen. And then that's where AI in this area is very important. Uh, we can look at it, it's just not just at the oiling area, the station itself, and in, in some part of the world, the, the petrol station, we call it the gas station itself, serves as a mini supermarket. So there's a lot of other services that require here. So let me push you to the uh, next slide, which actually shows what has been done in the uh, gas station in Sunchen. So they actually use on our device and a lot of things that they are looking at. And uh, something that well, maybe is uh, closer to us in uh, this part of the world, Asia Pacific, and perhaps uh, other parts of the world, is the actual parking violation. So uh, a lot of people actually uh, went to the bus, gas station and illegally parked their car. And this is where the AI can help to monitor and also to track on this. And another area about uh, fire uh, gas station that, that we tend to ignore is the ability to uh, fire fighting or fire access. This is, this is where AI will help to ensure that key area uh, uh, evacuation centers are all been uh, unblocked. So of course, uh, the key thing to it, and uh, we have no know in the past that the uh, usage of the phone during uh, refueling is prohibited. But we do know there are from time to time people who uh, that tend to flaunt the rule. Uh, the idea here is not to catch them, but actually to remind them that, uh, that they should not use the phone. We actually don't want to go out and issue of summon or fine. But we want AI to be able to detect that somebody is using the phone and somebody they go out and advise the person to stop using it. So this is the whole idea of the recording AI today. It's not so much of a, of a, of a discouragement, but most, most, most likely to uh, assist human into uh, doing better things. The third thing that I want to share is the, uh, another area that's close to our heart is the bank. So uh, banks, as, as I said earlier, we are doing a lot of KYC. Uh, know your customer 360 degree but a lot of these are actually done at the back end so basically you look at the customer's data look at his uh, transaction history look at the document that he submitted but we are kind of missing something in today that's the, the, the human part of it so we, as we know humans we go to the brand outlet the, the bank branches to do our transaction so is there any way we can improve that? In fact, a lot of customers today, as you remember in my younger days, we are very frustrated with the long queue, with a number of uh, counter that's not available. So with AI today, we are able to do that. We are able to detect that the number of crowds are there, uh, whether the people are happy or not, as we can look at their face, whether they are front or whether they're frustrating. We look at the behavior. Of course, we look at the queue depth. How many people are queuing there? Uh, do we need to immediately open up an additional counter or we need some crowd control over there? So this is something that's very important to the bank and I'm glad that it's actually been implemented in a very big scale. Uh, some of these banks that we see here, uh, these are, you will notice that a lot of them are either in China, but don't be, don't be uh, misled by that because banks in China tend to have uh, more branches than a lot of, of us in the world. So just look at the one particular bank here, the China Merchant Bank. They actually have thousands of branches throughout China. So this is something that's actually on a massive scale. On going in terms of banking, of course, what the other thing is uh, who are the VIP customers? So I, are we able to identify them? Are we able to know that they are arriving at our branches so that we can give them a, a special treatment to actually usher them to, to a certain area that uh, make their experience better? So this is where AI is going to come in, right? Today, we know that AI can do facial recognition. And uh, with that, we will be able to alert or actually to inform some of the staff in the bank to actually look out for their VIP when they arrive. With that, uh, I'm going to end my presentation and I'm going to show you some of the things that we can do, some of the product that we have, because earlier we, we saw about the the oral framework, because this is the, the, the thing that we can do uh, with the, the, all the boxes. Don't worry about the boxes as we, uh, if we are, have interest, uh, we can uh, spend more time, dwell deeper into it. Because the idea here is that when you come to Huawei, not just on the software, the framework, the application, we do have a product that you can actually make use of. And of course, most important thing in Huawei, 
what we do for AI is not just about a product. We actually enablement that we call about enablement resource and support. So enablement is something that we, we are actually focusing a lot. If you have time, sometime do go to our essence.com where you can actually find that we have a courses that's available. There's a lot of information uh, on AI basic, very simple AI basic, hands-on hands -on course and some ex expert lectures as well. And then in, if you are an, an keen to embark on our product, you can actually look at some of the developer guide, some of the to, uh, uh, tools that we have, some coding, some very nice example that we actually put it, posted on the resource center. Of course, the list, but not end, is a support center. If you have anything that you want to know more about our product, or if you have our product and you need some support, this is one area that you can uh, go in and uh, take a look. With that, uh, I would like to end my presentation and uh, hand it over to Leo. Thank you, everybody. Okay. Thank you, BG. Uh, hi, good morning, everybody. Uh, so my name is Leo Zhang, uh, Chief Digital Officer for Huawei Cloud AI Business Group. Uh, so today I'd like to probably take you a little bit further, right? Uh, I think given everything BJ has shared, uh, and as a, as a startup, you will be wondering how we can support you. So, the, so let's go beyond than just developers. So Huawei is launching a program called Spark, uh, which is to support and accelerate the startup community. Uh, we said, let me just put this on the screen. I'm not sure I hear some uh, noise, uh, so if you can put yourself on mute. Sorry, <coughs> sorry, something in my eyes. Apologies. Okay, so uh, let me talk about Huawei Spark. First, first and foremost, why do we do? Uh, why do we launch a Huawei Spark program? Um, as you probably seen, I mean, the AI the AI community is mostly made of application that is go beyond uh, any vertical or any technology um, vertical. So where Huawei focuses more on the fundamental, the the infrastructure layer, we realize the innovation is a driving force for adoption of AI. And that goes beyond, you know, AI it applies to, you know, IoT and 5G. Uh, so that's why we launched Huawei Spark. Uh, it's, a, it's a hybrid accelerator and, and uh, incubator. Uh, and it focuses on more on the deep tech uh, sector of the, of the innovation. Um, and I'll explain why. So when, I, when we look at the, the startup uh, ecosystem, I think there's fi five fundamental survival factors that are really key to the success or survival rate of a startup. Um, one, obviously, as a startup, you need uh, the initial investment to jumpstart. Uh, so that's very important. And secondly, for you to develop the, the, the company, the platform meaning, you know, is a virtual st uh, structure where, you know, it connects you with the investors, you know, the incubators, uh, your customers uh, and your, your social network. So that's important to, to be able to get on the platform and getting support from this platform. Education is more about, you know, supporting the founding team, uh, the startup, uh, as how do you do uh, product design? How do you go to market? Uh, how do you design a, a best business model? Uh, so this is the kind of education you need from, from the community. Um, of course, uh, you know, sales marketing is always key because growth is, num is number one um, thing for a startup and to, you know, to grow fast and nonstop. So those are the four fundamental, uh, you know, elements of, you know, we, we call it survival factors for, for most of um, VCs and incubators that, that is providing today. And if I look at other technology service providers, uh, so I won't repeat the five factors and what you probably seen more is they do provide a, another factor, which is technology. Uh, so a lot of VC and incubator, they are, they're not necessarily a, a technology service provider. So here, as a TSP, they do give you support, you know, either it's, you know, software or hardware or training. Uh, and and it, that made really the five uh, factors, uh, you know, complete uh, for your success. So when, when we design Huawei Spark, uh, we look at all five factors. And I think it's important for us to have uh, a holistic view on all five, but also to be very mindful on who we are and what we do best. So the Huawei Spark is, uh, I would say, 
the key strengths for us, you know, we, we really focus on technology. Uh, like you've seen from BJ's slide how, you know, end to end or comprehensive is our technology stack is. Uh, but in the meantime, um, you know, we are building a network of, uh, you know, VCs and government um, uh, enterprises, which I'll show you more, uh, as well as we really focus on the sales and marketing side of startup, which is help you to grow your business. And again, there is a, a detailed uh, program going behind how can we support you on the sales and marketing, which I'll share later on. Uh, in the meantime, the education, whether it's about business uh, enablement or it's technology training, um, you know, it has been, you know, has been a key fo focus for for Huawei Spark. So, what what really make our technology stack, uh, you know, outstanding here is, if I look at everything that Huawei provides from, you know. You know, connectivity, that's the bread and butter of Huawei, you know, talking about 5G. Uh, and infrastructure, which is, uh, you know, the cloud infrastructure, whether it's private or, or public. And the AI, you know, where we focus more on the fundamental architectural and the chip, chip level uh, and provide you with the framework of developing AI. Uh, but there, there is a pretty big open space in terms of application. That's something Huawei never do. Uh, you know, we say at the, at the bottom, we'll provide you with infrastructure at the top. We don't do, we don't touch data. So that's where, you know, we draw the, the synergy uh, between us and our partners. So when we look at the, uh, the type of startups uh, that we're looking for, uh, we say it's deep tech. Uh, so really we focus on the five key factors in terms of technology here. So uh, AI, IoT, 5G, Edge Computer, and SaaS. Um, and then when we look at, uh, you know, the industry, uh, those are five industries that we have seen a lot of traction uh, within Huawei uh, um, within Huawei uh, enterprise uh, business. Um, so we think it's important we share those uh, resources with you, and and also recognizing different startups have a different need and probably at a different stage, you different need, need a different level of support. So we have an incubator here where we focus more on the seed to early early stage startup. Uh, so you're getting support uh, on ongoing basis, probably less, less, um, uh, I would say less proactive, um, but you know, allow you to, to get the, the nutrient from, from Huawei and, and to, to carry on. Where if you're admitted to the accelerator tier, this is something which is a lot more focused on so a six months accelerator program. Uh, we're designed we design that to achieve a specific goal, whether it's about going to a new market or launching a new product or, or getting a acquisition of a new logo. Uh, so, so the accelerator here has a, a lot more specific goal uh, and is measured on the success of, of the program. Uh, so in terms of what we provide, um, in, in terms of incubation tier, uh, we provide financial support um, in the sense of uh, you know, as a you know, cloud credits, you get up to 125,000 US. Um, and on top of that, we also provide a, a development fund. So if you are going to develop uh, something with Huawei, um, with our Huawei AI product line, uh, we will provide you with up to 100,000 US um, cash to support you in the R&D funding and, and development. Uh, the technology support is more around, you know, your operational uh, support in terms of consultancy or tech support uh, and in the right with the right company uh, once we qualify into the accelerator tier we will also provide you with R&D support so this is about co-creation co-development uh, especially I think with a lot of ASEAN based startups you might struggle getting uh, you know talents and, and, and the quality of talent uh, this is where Huawei uh, can draw upon a huge R&D uh, capability and support you on. Training and resources, uh, you know, uh, you know, goes without saying. I think it's important to really talk about the, the other three. Uh, so the go-to-market go support is more about uh, your brand awareness. So we take you through different market. Uh, so this is more about joint events. Uh, some of the events are very, uh, you know, had a very high exposure, you know, like Huawei Connect that we do that once a year. Uh, we also invite you into different um, regional events, like we run a competition in as a hackathon and also as well as startup competition, um, you will be invited to join uh, a monthly network, social networking events with Huawei Spark. Uh, and that allows you to do some, uh, you know, 
uh, networking and also brand, uh, I guess, you know, just getting to know different, different people. Um, and as I mentioned earlier, we built this uh, 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 platform based on um, having different stakeholders in our advisory board. So, so this advisory board really give you the, uh, the insight in terms, you know, the subject matter experts within Huawei and, and industry and KOLs. Uh, we also have founders uh, who are already a bit established, uh, come in and talk about their experience and best practice. Of course, uh, from the lens of uh, you know venture capital firms, it's important for for them to share how they see how they see you and you know where can you can you improve in order to get your fundraising successful. Uh, and the government official given a lot of support in our program to ensure you know we we are in the right space uh, from the local support perspective. So all of that we we made this uh, advisory board. And uh, like I mentioned earlier, we run a, a monthly networking events. Uh, uh, so not necessarily all six will come in, but you know, generally speaking, we'll have someone uh, participating in our monthly event. And every six months, we run a, a startup roadshow uh, event. Uh, so that's where your typical pitch day, you, you, you'll be given an opportunity to pitch to the investors. Last but not least, um, I think personally, I have run uh, two startups myself uh, before I joined Huawei. I think number one, I've also been working for you know MNC for 16 years. So I feel I feel the pain at both sides, right? As a startup, what's really important to you is to grow uh, and don't stop. And in order to grow, if you're in the B2B business, you need to get your first reference customer, your first logo. Uh, and on the flip side, the, the big MNCs are, they always struggle to get the right type of solution because the, the customization is required. And, that's why they go with like of you know IBM or Centra, although they know that the, those companies doesn't necessarily have all the solution. They will be subcontracting, but they don't really have a choice because the internal process and governance. Uh, so that gap is a very prominent. Um, you know when when I, you know when I you know look look at those um, you know for both of startup and and, and MSC's perspective. So the Spotfire program was designed to bridge that gap. Uh, essentially, it, it does three things to support your growth. Um, so sell to, sell with, and sell through. Sell to, it means uh, it allows you, you as a startup to sell your solution to Huawei uh, if we find the right fit. You know, as a 125, 23 billion company, we, 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 we do work with thousands of you know, different service providers. So I, I certainly hope the next one will be you. Uh, sell with, it means um, if I look at the the sector, we're probably the first one who will say we we'll open our our uh, enterprise portfolio uh, in in both uh, you know top the the, you know, the top tier of you know top five hundred fortune companies as well as the medium uh, small medium size. Basically, we're trying to find a problem statement uh, within our client portfolio. Where's the solution? Um, if that solution does match, then we will facilitate the the process. So you go through POC. Uh, you know, contract negotiation until until the end. So Huawei will support you through that um, that process, um, and sometimes you will see a hurdle of getting on board with any large organization. Huawei will support you through the onboarding process of our own. Um, and sales through meaning we'll put you on top of our um, app development HMS uh, Huawei mobile system ecosystem or uh, Huawei apps gallery. So that way you get access to 600 million. Uh, Huawei mobile users uh, instantly, and also you'll be put on Huawei Cloud Marketplace, uh, where I think we have about three million business users by now. So, so in short, those three really is going to boost uh, a your existing uh, client opportunities, uh, your pipeline opportunities, and secondly, it can probably um, fast track a lot of the process that you might experiencing uh, delays. Um, and then certainly it will give you good exposure in terms of your brand awareness. So, uh, and last but not least, this is probably my last slide. Uh, just realize some of you might might be uh, in a similar uh, industry like us. You are you are you are the accelerators or incub incubators or VC of your own. Uh, we do like to work with you guys as well. Um, so the three value proposition we provide to you: one, uh, you know, we provide you with access to the high growth startups. Um, 
And, and the Huawei Spark is more focused on APAC, Asia Pacific. Um, so we do op operate in quite a number of countries. Uh, so that gives us a pretty wide access to different startups in different, uh, different parts of the world. Uh, secondly, which is a key focus, is, is about grow your portfolio companies uh, via the Spark program. Um, and Huawei fortunately had a very strong uh, R&D capability. So that gave us a lot of know-how uh, and a future uh, insight into in innovation. Uh, so that's something we can provide to you as an as a advisory service. So with that, uh, let me end my presentation uh, and I shall pass on to Easy. Uh, maybe before the time is being passed over to Easy, uh, we just have a very quick poll on uh, based on what Leo has shared. If you'd like to know more about the Huawei Spark program, just indicate your interest. Okay, maybe we give it about uh, five more seconds. Okay, a little bit more because we see quite a good uh, response coming in. And okay, I guess uh, that's about it. So yeah, easy. Uh, it's your show. Thanks so much, Raymond, uh, and thanks so much, SG Innovate, for having us here today. Um, so really quickly introducing myself, uh, my name is Izzy, and I currently explore, uh, support Expansion and Entrepreneur First, uh, and we're the world's first talent investor. So we go way early stage, even before the incubator stage. Instead of investing in companies, we actually invest in individuals to build deep tech companies, uh, even pre-teen and pre-idea. Uh, we've built over 50 AI companies globally, including Magic Pony Technology, uh, one of our portfolio companies that uh, sold to Twitter in 2016, and that was using neural nets for video compression. Uh, I'm really excited to be here today to be, you know, with some of the biggest key players who are both building and supporting AI companies in Asia Pacific. Uh, and I'm excited to, you know, ask them questions and get them to share some insight with you today as well. Um, just a reminder, we have a chance for you to ask questions. There is a Q&A box on Zoom, so feel free to pop it in there. Uh, so to kick us off, uh, Ben, Shanali, Leo, could I get you to quickly introduce yourselves and, and what you do? Uh, Shanali, would you like to go first? <clears throat> sure, thanks. Uh, thanks, Izzy. Thanks, everyone, for having me here. And thanks, SG Innovate, for organizing this event. Um, I'm Shanali Krishnaswamy. I'm the CTO of IDA Technologies. Ida is a Singapore, uh, Singapore based, uh, basically deep technology startup as it's called. We're a machine learning company to put it simply. Uh, what we do is we develop machine learning solutions for insurance and banking. So our products are uh, in insurance, uh, in the insurance area, we do the end to end for insurance. So we have a product which will basically do claims, underwriting, uh, agent management, um, as well as customer engagement. So it's basically a machine learning platform on which all the insurance uh, requirements are sort of met. Uh, we also have a, a smart loans offering in banking. So those are our two products uh, that we, we basically uh, go around developing and selling. Yeah, I guess I'll go. Uh, good morning, everyone. My name is Ben. I'm here in Hong Kong. Uh, I run Eurekinova, which is an open innovation platform of New World Development. Uh, for those who don't know, New World Development, um, we're a $10 billion company that's um, in property, uh, in infrastructure, in hotels and retail. Um, part of why the open innovation platform uh, is existing is that we're um, now exploring how we could actually partner with a lot of these uh, different types of startups that could integrate within our businesses. Um, a large majority of how we operate is based on uh, results uh, in terms of how can we actually uh, bring a startup into the business units and create business value, whether that could be revenue, cost optimization, data intelligence. Uh, these are um, some of the important KPIs that we measure in every integration. I was going to say, Leo, can you introduce yourself? But I forgot you already did a 10 yeah. presentation. Um, thank you so much, guys. Um, so I'll kick it off. My first question is for Ben. Um, so you also work with a lot of early stage startups. Um, 
Could you share a little bit more around some of the most challenging issues that startups have when, you know, starting their AI companies in the APAC region? Um, and specifically, I'd love to hear from you around how have you advised them to overcome these challenges um, and lay good foundations to be able to scale? Yeah, I think I, I, I'm going to kind of emulate a little bit of what Leo said earlier. Um, but, but maybe I'll touch on kind of the basics and, and fundamentals of um, when it comes to AI startups, right? I think that's the first question. Are you really an AI startup? I think AI is right now uh, a hot keyword and every startup in the market is calling themselves AI. Um, but I think ask a few questions, you'll start to be able to differentiate if this company is truly uh, AI or if it's actually more task oriented and it's an automation company, right? And maybe it's an aspiring uh, AI company, but not yet there, right? I think first of all, this needs to be differentiated. Uh, on a second level, it's really on um, how do the customers perceive it, whether it's a B or a C customer. Um, I think AI in general is it, such a broad stroke at the moment. Uh, being able to define what your AI actually solves, whether it's actually replacing human tasks, uh, whether it's learning in certain scenarios and coming up with certain business results. I think these are also very um, important to address as an AI startup. But the most important, back to kind of what Leo was mentioning, is scalability. And are you going to be able to land your first customer or your reference customer to actually kind of help you scale? And uh, that's essentially what we do. Uh, we spend a lot of our time looking at some of these AI companies, how we can integrate it within our organization. Uh, so as a reference point, uh, we invested in IB out of Beijing. And IB, uh, we, we went through a, a, a series of co-creation opportunities, and now uh, we've adopted a lot of their technology in our K-11 space in Guangzhou, um, in the parking lot, all the way to the retail space. So we try to create kind of an end-to-end -end journey. We went through a pilot um, first, it was a four-month pilot, and now we're kind of full-on uh, rolling out their technology uh, in our space. So I think given them that kind of platform or from a start perspective, able to acquire that first customer at scale. It really helped them uh, kind of create a launch pad for themselves. Uh, and now they're kind of all over the place. Yeah. Perfect. And you know, that, that, you know, uh, bridges me into the next question, which is around, uh, and this is for all of you, Ben, Leo, Shanali, uh, BG, um, speaking around, around uh, gaining your first customer, you know, what are some of the key barriers that startups need to overcome in order to sell into enterprises uh, to really enable them to scale up as well? Okay, uh, uh, let me take this one. Uh, as I have an awful lot of uh, pain, uh, you know, sitting on enterprise. So, so I think first that I think people need to understand all MNCs, you know, of all size will suffer from one issue, which they have something called procurement um, organization. Uh, that procurement organization has one objective, which is to uh, screening down the list of vendors to who they can work with. So by that, I think that elim eliminate a lot of chances for startup to pitch at them. Uh, so either from because your size, your size or your stability, um, I think that e that itself is a is a probably biggest hurdle. Uh, once you're able to demonstrate that you have stability by having a reference customer or being on the market for a few years, then you have a fighting chance. Uh, and then you're, what you're trying to fight on is to be standing out from the likes of others, right? So having a reference customer is very important. Uh, to be able to demonstrate a POC successfully is, is secondly important. Um, and to be able to have the patient um, as well as a, a coach within the organization is, cri is critically important. Uh, so my, my, my short, recommendation is um, if, if you're a size of you know you know any company like before series a you have let's say a team of 50 your best chance is probably go with uh, unless you have a, a, a good insight within the organization your best chance will probably be working with uh, ISI organization or somebody who can can wave you in um, the onboarding process is notorious uh, bad within big organization when I'm talking about six or to 12 months uh, uh, duration. So, so that whether you can survive that six months uh, is something you have to think about first. Uh, but always try to partner with someone, uh, give you the first uh, door opener, um, and then 
uh, demonstrate your success by you know being very agile. I think a lot of MNC are very aware of who you are as a as a startup, so they're willing to give you a, a chance. So pitching at the right level, don't pitch necessarily at the technology level. Speak in the language they are familiar with, and trust me, a lot of people doesn't even understand what AI is, apart from you know spelling of it. Uh, so be be able to speak the language they they're familiar with. Uh, doing a demo at um, you know at the technology layer only with the techie. Like I'm talking about, you know, the, the DevOps guys, the, the IT operation guys, uh, that will give you um, a foundation. Uh, and then eventually, it's about, um, you know, having that endure endurance, um, you know, for the for the six to to nine months time. Uh, that's 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 all for me. Yeah, maybe I can share um, a, a couple of factors that have worked uh, for our startups. Uh, first of all, there's no kind of secret sauce uh, when it comes to um, you know gaining enterprise customer. Uh, I will say that uh, one of our startups uh, really uh, kind of nailed it uh, for the moment in terms of, uh, he said, if you as a startup and there are in a management team that have corporate experience, that helps. And I think uh, kind of like Leo said, understanding corporal structure and then understanding that a procurement team will probably cut you out and you need alternative uh, ways of getting in and having uh, the understanding of the factors that each business group would consider uh, when making those decisions that will help you kind of uh, throughout the negotiation process or mapping out what the POC is going to look like is very important but for sure uh, what we've seen that worked really well is actually a human element which is having someone on your team that manages the project or the pilot between the uh, startup and the business unit and being able to outline what the objectives are, what are the resources required, what's the timeline that's agreed upon, and making sure that both sides have skin in the game uh, and making sure that we're able to kind of deliver on both sides. That just helps the uh, conversion uh, that we've seen uh, actually uh, get a little bit higher uh, than usual. Yeah. Um, I could just add, uh, I guess, not so much wisdom, but my own experience of the last few years. Uh, so Ida, Ida started around 2016, towards the end of 2016, right? Uh, and our first customer actually went to press saying that they are now doing AI-based health claims. And that was Prudential, and that was in 2017, end of 2017. And, uh, and we actually got an award from the Monetary Authority for that work, which was the FinTech Innovation Award at the Singapore FinTech Festival. So uh, our journey was that uh, one of the things that really helped us as a company was actually that platform that the Singapore FinTech Festival provided us because we were basically going in saying we're going to deliver machine learning products to banks and insurance. So the FinTech Festival was a great platform. And what happened was that we participated in a accelerator, which was run by the Monetary Authority of Singapore. It was called the Global FinTech Accelerator. And it had some 600 odd startups and we actually ended up winning that, right? So we were one of the three winners. So that kind of gave us a lot of uh, press and publicity because we were one of the three winners. There was a lot of media around that at the festival. And a lot of people came around to have a chat with us. And, uh, but it was not easy just because we ended up winning that didn't mean that we immediately got our reference customer. Uh, so I can sort of relate to all the things that Leo and Ben are saying. Uh, our reference customer was actually Prudential, but we had to go through not one, but multiple POCs before they actually signed up uh, to take our solution in, right? So the first POC was more like, okay, let's see what you can do kind of thing. Um, and then after that, they saw that the results were very, very good. So then they said, okay, this is kind of serious. So let's really do a, a, a pilot, so to speak, right? And this pilot, they pitched us, I guess, obviously I won't name this very large MNC, but they basically said, look, Ida, you've got two weeks. This is the data. These are all the things that we want done. And we're also going to give this to so-and-so, right? And so-and-so was a combination of two very large companies, a very large Singaporean company and a very large multinational company. The kind of resources, the money power, the muscle power that they have, Ida at that point, there was, even today we cannot have, right? Um, but anyhow, at the end of two weeks, I think what we did was we really showed that what we had was not a general purpose 
technology or solution. It was machine learning applied to insurance. So I think that is the key, right? To have, a, 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 I think Leo mentioned, speaking the language that, the, that your client understands, that they can actually see that you know their business and you've developed something that, uh, that answers to what they need, right? I think that has been one of the big things that has really helped us. Um, I mean, I, I'm sure all the other things apply too, but this is just an anecdote from how we got our first customer. We really have to fight very hard and fight many battles to get there. Well yeah. done. Well done. Yeah, that's that's a great story, Shanali. I'd, I'd love to do a uh, follow-up question. So along the process, um, and then for your next customer and customers after, how did you, what was your process to identify their priorities and then address them, right? I, I think uh, Ben was saying it's really helpful to have somebody on the team who understands corporate structure. Um, did you have somebody like that on your team? Yeah, How did you get yeah, through that process? I, I think Ben is you know, absolutely spot on. So if they had left it to me, we wouldn't have done it. I can honestly tell you, I'm, I used to be an academic. I manage the technology in IDA and I think I do that part, but uh, I have two co-founders, both of whom are very experienced. Uh, so my CEO, he, he worked for uh, both MNC's consulting firms and then he was in government. Uh, so he used to be an executive director at ASTAR, which is the Agency for Science, Technology and Research. So he used to lead like the 600 person organization with you know 400 people with PhD. So he had a lot of experience. And our COO was the director for industry engagement at ASTAR. Again, had a lot of experience with the things that Ben as well as Leo alluded to you know, negotiating things through the structure of a multinational company, uh, you know, going through the procurement and so on. So I think in that sense, uh, we did have more experienced founders on the startup. But if people don't have that kind of, uh, you know, uh, people on their, uh, you know, in their, in their team, uh, if they are very young startup with very young founders, then, then definitely they should really reach out to organizations like, uh, Huawei or SG Innovate, et cetera, who are, who are willing to provide that kind of support, right? I think that, that, that makes a big difference. Yeah, absolutely. That's awesome. Uh, we have a question from the audience, Stanley G. Uh, he says, thanks, Shanali Ben and Leah for your thoughts. What would your top advice for startups that want to work with corporates as they scale? Are pilot projects between corporates and startups an effective way? Or, are they, <clears throat> or do they usually not result in commercial contracts? And maybe uh, this one's for Leo, Ben and BG uh, as well. Okay. Um... Uh, that's an excellent question. Uh, so again, speaking of my previous experience, so I used to manage innovation uh, for Vodafone in APAC. I've done that for about uh, five years. Uh, so in this five years of my time, I work with a lot of, uh, not necessarily startups, right? So ISVs, you know, a uh, company who already have a pretty good presence on, on the market. And I must say, right, um, a lot of organizations today have a team called innovation, whether they're called innovation champion or innovation manager. Uh, so I think, I think a lot of uh, MSC are aware of this uh, this rising community, and they all want to do something. Um, and generally, it's a very small team, so they have maybe one, no, I think best case, five people within that team. It depends on the size of the company, uh, and they are not very techy. Um, so, so I think the first advice, I think again, I repeat, uh, you got to understand the buying center of your of your audience uh, from both commercial technology operation because they all have a different agenda. Um, the innovation champion is about getting the best idea into the organization as a channel manager, but really the buying center is not her or, or him. It's about the CIO and CTO, and you won't get access to them uh, immediately anyway. Um, so you need to have some someone who can take you through that, that process. Um, and secondly, your st your solution has to stand out. I think uh, you know, uh, Shanali mentioned very strongly, right? You need to have the know-how. That's your fundamental. If you don't have that, um, I think a lot of AI company, as I see, uh, I mean, they're all using a pretty good. Um, they all have a pretty good use cases. Uh, so, and they're probably all using the similar open source uh, model, yeah, AI model, whether it's your YOLO or your STD for, you know, single object detection or, or real time object detection. But what's your differentiation? Right? So it's like me looking at all of them having a claim of um, the best AI for NLP or machine learning or all of it. 
And the fundamental is in how much data set you have. Um, and we talk about deep tech, right? So deep tech doesn't necessarily mean you have the best technology. I, I rather think, uh, I think it was Ben or Shunani mentioned, your vertical insight, you know, what is your uh, solution to the last mile problem of AI? That is your differentiator, right? In, in Huawei, and, and like, you know, AWS and Azure, we build on the fundamental AI infrastructure. We don't go into the, uh, the last mile, which is something we cannot do effectively because the size and, and the market where we are aiming at. Whereas as you start up, let's say you're doing AI for real estate uh, or blockchain, right? You got to understand, you know, what problem that blockchain is solving, you know, the trust problems of real estate, you know, how do you get the, you know, the, the, the consortium of different, you know, real estate agents together. Uh, I mean, there's different ver vertical issues. That's something you should focus on. And that, that's where you should get your data and demonstrate your know-how. Uh, and once you be, and trust me, I think, uh, Shinani, you think the, the big players are strong? I don't think that they are that strong. I mean, I've seen them and we are one of them that, as well. They, they probably have a best business uh, guy who can talk about stuff on a PowerPoint. But when it comes down to implementation, they struggle as well. So, so I don't think you need to be necessarily feeling uh, inferior than them. You definitely have the strength, your agility, your know-how, if you have that. Uh, and, and getting the right people on, on your team, getting you through the initial discussion, uh, and then your success rate will be like high. Uh, all in all, I think uh, the, the survival rate is higher and higher uh, as the, you know, there's more and more uh, supporting structure going behind startups, uh, but it is still pretty difficult. That's all for me. Yeah, I'll, I'll add a couple of um, you know, elements to that. I think number one, uh, if you're a startup and you're looking to get into a program uh, to help you scale better, one is to understand uh, what startup platform you're getting yourself into, right? Um, look at the results and if uh, they are in fact trying to really help your startup get into the organization. I think there are a lot of corporate innovation uh, platforms. There are a lot of accelerators and incubators. Um, in the end, uh, is it a PR play or is it a business result play? That's um, for one kind of like one phase that you should go through as a startup before getting into any program. Number two is to really understand if the business units that are participating in these programs actually have skin in the game. And uh, there are several ways to do that. One, uh, if you have insight, did that business unit pay to be part of that program uh, within the group? And if so, that's already skin the game. Uh, number two, uh, are there problem statements that are clearly written out? Do they have startup requirements? Do they have business requirements that are also written out? And can that program actually articulate it? And if that's the case, again, you know, phase two in. Uh, and I think if, the, the more you understand how the program is structured and if it is actually results driven, then you're getting yourself uh, into kind of a good quality program. And I think that's important because from a business unit perspective or a startup perspective, you don't want to waste time. I mean, we value productivity, not efficiency, right, overall. So I think that spending that upfront work to understand those programs uh, will save you a lot of time when you actually go into these programs. Maybe I'll just add one thing, which, uh, you know, because the question was about pilots and are they an effective mechanism. Uh, this is just my own learning is that uh, I think skin in the game was mentioned, and I think that's a really, really important point, right? Uh, because everybody will be willing to do pilots if they are typically free of cost, right? So I, my advice is that there must be something, something there, uh, you know, some, some kind of cost that is involved in uh, doing a pilot. It can be nominal, it, can, it doesn't have to be very big because no one's gonna pay some, a lot of money for a pilot, but they must pay something, I think. Uh, and that's a negotiation that I think each startup must do because I, I learned and we learned the hard way that sometimes people just make you do things and they're not really very serious, right? And the usually the ones who are not serious are where it's free of cost because if there is even a small cost of $20,000 or something like that involved, they have to onboard you into their system. And that onboarding into the, what do you call the payment system? You know, you have to basically be a vendor and a, yep. a credited vendor. They have to, you have to invoice them. It goes through a system. 
Now, if it goes through that system, it means that there is somebody up there signing, saying that this is serious, we are going to try this out, and if it works, we may take it on further, right? At least you have that much. Uh, whereas if it's totally free of cost, then what happens is that you end up doing a lot of work and then it's, it may or may not go anywhere. So my advice would be to always work in a nominal cost for a POC to identify who, which of your customers are really serious about this. And, and speaking to the right people, I think that's critical, right? The, the real owner of this system or technology that you're providing, uh, are you really, is this going into the operations? For instance, let's say it's smart claims for us. It's an operations uh, technology, right? So it's always going to be under the COO. So you really need to find the head of claims, the COO, the head of operations. These are the kind of people that would be interested in this technology. If you take it to somebody else, they're not going to be interested in this because it doesn't answer to their business KPI. So I think understanding who in the organization is a real buyer of your, of your technology, who's going to benefit from this technology. I think those are the kind of uh, questions that startups should ask before they embark. Let me add, add on something to what uh, Leo, Ben, and Shanali have said. I think most important thing is uh, in today's world, uh, the game has changed a lot. Uh, I, I would advise any startup not to fight alone. So get a, go with your friends. Where are your friends? Like, like what Liverpool, Liverpool Football Club has said, you never work alone and you should not work alone now. Right. So very important as what Leo has said to earlier on the Spark program. This is something that I, I will also advise all the startup. Uh, beside Huawei, I'm sure there are other, other good provider on these services. Do embark on them because in today's world, we, we can never do everything. And in fact, if you look at Huawei alone, uh, there's something that I, I would say is a value that only Huawei can provide is the global insight. We are able to share with our, our partners what happened in the world what happened in 170 countries. And with this type of knowledge, you actually can enhance your competitiveness. Because in today's world, every project, there are actually thousands of people vying for it. So what makes you stand up? Is your knowledge, and is, is, your, is a future forecast that's very important. That's all I want to add. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Ben. And I mean, as much as, guys, I mean, you're, we're looking for you as well, right? That's why having this, this, this webinar. It's about, we, I think we are the soil, uh, and if we are to grow, make this earth more flourish, it's gonna not gonna be us just being the soil. It's gonna be your seed. Uh, you know, the the, the the nutrient we put into the soil is to help it to grow. Uh, but if you don't come in, you know, there's nothing. So so please do come forward and, and look at the Spark, look at Huawei, look at the technology uh, and and the, the marketplace that we provide to you. You know, yeah, we're really looking forward to hear from you guys. And with that, I think we are at time. Um, I know there are a lot of questions that have come through. Thanks, Stanley, Roman, and James. Uh, unfortunately, we don't have any more time to address them, but uh, maybe SU Innovate can help facilitate uh, getting you an answer to those questions. Um, thank you so much, Ben, Leo, Shanali, and BG for joining us. I'm sorry we um, you know, had to cut this short because of uh, time issues, but uh, I really enjoyed speaking to all of you. Uh, I really enjoyed hearing your insights. Uh, and thank you, SG Innovate, for having us as well. Thank you, Izzy. Thank you, Izzy. Thank you. Thank you, Izzy. Good to meet you with everyone. Thanks, guys. Thank you. Bye. Yeah, so thank you, Izzy, for the wonderful discussion with the speakers. So I'd just like to represent SG Innovate as well to thank all the attendees who stayed with us till now. Big thank you to all our speakers, uh, Ben, Shanali, Leo, BG, for all the discussion points uh, raised by everyone. So just uh, letting the attendees know, do keep a lookout for the post-event mail, which will, containing, uh, which will contain a recording of this session. And do reach out to us at events at sgnovate.com if you'd like to connect with any of our speakers, or even just to know more about uh, Huawei Spark program. And, and if you'd like to get connected to them, do write in and let us know. Uh, we'll be also uh, attaching the slides so that uh, you can actually refer to it and uh, yeah, feel free to have a chat with us. So also do give your post-event feedback when you exit the webinar and with that, I think uh, we'll sign off for the webinar. Hope everyone will have a great day ahead. Stay safe, stay healthy. Hope to have you with our next webinar session. Yeah, and goodbye. For the speakers, uh, do stay on for a while. I would like to have everyone to just have a very quick picture to commemorate the event. So just, uh, can I just have you to just have quick wave in front of the oh. camera 
and my colleague Jody will just help us take a very quick picture. Jody? Hello everyone, this is Street Your Camera and I'll count down to three. Three, two, one. Okay, one, three, two, one. Okay, thank you so much. Okay, thank you. Thank you, everyone. you. Thanks, Thanks, guys. Bye. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye. Bye.